Well, welcome to this week's Gospel Bible video study. Um, the last several weeks, we've heard stories of, from Mark's Gospel, which portrayed Jesus' immense popularity. <clears throat> While preaching and teaching, he was often, almost always, surrounded by crowds. Crowds so large that at one time he has to sit in a boat offshore of the Sea of Galilee so the large number of people on shore can see him and hear him. Last week, we heard the story of the crowds of followers surrounding Jesus, hemming in on him as he made the way to Jairus' house to heal his sick daughter. Jesus was a popular figure. Many people followed him. Many people loved him. And many people believed in him and embraced him as the one sent by God. But not everybody. And the scene switches in this week's gospel story from Mark chapter 6. This week, we hear of Jesus' being rejected and ridiculed. And strangely enough, <clears throat> this rejection comes from the people living in his own hometown of Nazareth. After all that had happened in and around the town of Capernaum on the northern shore of the Sea of Galilee, Jesus and his disciples made the 20-mile journey back to Nazareth, the town where he grew up and where his mother and siblings still seem to have lived. As was his custom, <clears throat> excuse me, Jesus went to the synagogue there to preach and teach on the Sabbath day. The Gospel writer tells us, many who heard him were astonished. But the question to ask ourselves is, what sort of astonishment was it? Was it the, wow, he's amazing type? Or was it more of the, now just wait a minute, what's going on here type? I would suspect that it was the latter. As the gospel writer tells us, the people in the synagogue said the following things. Where did this man get all this? What is the wisdom that has been given to him? What deeds of power are being done by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the mother of James and Joses and Judas and Simon, and are not his sisters here with us? The people of Nazareth had trouble believing that one of their own, someone as ordinary as Jesus, could be the cause of such commotion and excitement. They wanted to know where he'd gotten the wisdom which he preached and taught because he hadn't gone to some elite rabbinical school. He was Jesus. They wanted to know how he was able to do the deeds of power about which they had heard, for I am sure the stories of Jesus' miracles and exorcisms had spread throughout Galilee. After all, in the midst of people living very ordinary lives, such as the residents of Galilee lived, Stories about things like these would spread like wildfire. But the residents of Nazareth had issues with Jesus. Why? I think it's simple. They knew him. Is not this the carpenter, they said. This is the verse in the New Testament that tells us that Jesus was a carpenter. He was a craftsman known to his fellow townspeople. They knew his family. To them he was, and again the quote from the Gospel, the son of Mary the brother of James and Joses and Judas and Simon, and are not his sisters here with us? Presumably, Jesus' father, Joseph, was no longer living since he's not mentioned, but the rest of his family seemed to still be living in Nazareth. And there was nothing special about them. And if there was nothing special about them, well, there certainly could be, couldn't be anything special about Jesus. End of discussion. As the gospel writer tells us, and they took offense at him. The Greek word used here for took offense at him is one we all know in English. It is the root of our English word scandal. They were scandalized by Jesus. And so Jesus was dismissed. These things being said about him could not be true. Jesus did not take kindly to this. He shot back at those in the synagogue. Prophets are not without honor except in their own hometown and among their own kin and in their own house. They wouldn't believe in him because they didn't want to believe in him. To them, he was too ordinary to possibly be the person others were proclaiming him to be. And the next verse is an interesting one. Here's what it says. And he, that's Jesus, and he could do no deed of power there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and cured them. The best way, I think, to interpret this verse is to go back and look at the previous miraculous deeds Jesus had performed in the Gospel. In all those cases, when Jesus healed someone or drove out evil spirits from them, it was because people came to Jesus. 
they came to him for help or were brought to Jesus for help. In the case of those possessed by spirits, the exorcisms were always preceded by a confrontation between Jesus and the possessed person. However, in Nazareth, where there was little or no faith in Jesus, people didn't come to him for help because, well, it just seems few people did. Jesus would not go out of his way to heal simply in order to impress the crowds. His deeds were always a response to request for help. But that didn't happen in Nazareth. As Mark tells us, and he was amazed at their unbelief. Up till now, people had been amazed at what Jesus had done. Now, unfortunately, it's Jesus' turn to be amazed, but in a negative way. It is in, very important to see, though, very important to see, that after his rejection in his own hometown, Jesus didn't give up. He did not throw up his hands in despair and quit. Instead, he expanded upon his work and enlarged his ministry. He called his 12 closest disciples and he sent them out in teams of two to continue his work. He gave them the ability to do what he had been doing, to cast out evil spirits. He sent them out with specific orders to not take any supplies or monies on their journeys throughout Galilee. Instead, they were to rely on the support of those whom they met on their journeys. As he told them, wherever you enter a house, stay there until you leave. Jesus knew that there were places where his disciples would be welcomed. People would listen to the message, Jesus' message, which they shared. They would come to them for healing. But Jesus also knew that the rejection he experienced in Nazareth would also extend elsewhere. Battle lines had been drawn about who Jesus was and what he was doing. He made this plain to his disciples, now missionaries, he was sending out. Here's what he said to them. If any place will not welcome you and they refuse to hear you, as you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony to them. Those who rejected Jesus' disciples would in turn be rejected. Now this may sound harsh to us. We may wonder why Jesus and his disciples didn't just stick around in Nazareth and other places and try and convince people about the message, the truth of his message. The answer most likely is that there, there simply wasn't time for this. Time was of the essence. The story that follows this one is the story of the execution of John the Baptist, who had been preaching a message very similar to the one Jesus was preaching. If John could be executed by the powers in charge, Jesus had to know that he too was in extreme danger if he continued down the path he was going. He did not have much time. Within two chapters in the gospel, Jesus would leave Galilee and head to Jerusalem, Jerusalem, where he would face betrayal, arrest, trial, and death. But now, before all of that, his disciples expanded on his work. As the gospel writer puts it, so they went out and proclaimed that all should repent. They cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and cured them. They do what Jesus had been doing. They did it in his name. They were no longer simply disciples, and the Greek word for disciple means students. Now they were missionaries. Now they didn't just follow Jesus. Now they worked for him, with him, spreading the message of the kingdom of God to as many people as possible. Jesus did not let rejection in Nazareth get the better of him. It did not defeat him. No, he used it instead as an opportunity to take a new path, to do more, incorporating his followers into his work, to make sure the good news of the kingdom of God was spread to as many as possible in the short time that remained. So thank you for watching this video today, and I invite you to join us for worship on Sunday as we gather to hear this text along with others in my message.